Uh, good evening, Wednesday night, August 5th. Uh, welcome to on, on live service, or live service, try that again, on Facebook Live. Um, tonight we're continuing the, the Beatitudes, but let's start in prayer. God, we just come to you now. We thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, all you've done, God. Uh, in in the, the troubles of our world, Lord, you're still God, and let us not forget that. Father, speak to us through your word tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. So tonight we're at the blessed are the meek, or blessed are the meek, or blessed are the humble, or happy are the humble, however you want to say it. Um, that's, that's the scriptures we're at, Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This word meek is gentle, humble, it's not weakness, but it's exercising God's strength under God's control. The reason we're going to talk about this a little bit is because what has Beatitudes to have to do with God? Um. It's part of God's word, of course, that's a common question, but what does that have to do with our life for God? What does being meek in our life have to do with bringing God glory? And that's where we need to, to realize. If we don't have the answer to bring him glory in everything that we do, um, then we need to question what we're doing. Um, Matthew 5, verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount so his Father would get the glory. He taught the disciples how to live so the Father would get the glory. His aim was to create a lifestyle that his disciples would make people think about the value of God, and as disciples, they would continue and teach others to disciple, and teach others to disciple, and so the glory of God would continue. The first petition of the Lord's Prayer, which stands at the center of the sermon, is Hallowed be thy name, our Father, hallowed be thy name, holy is thy name. And that was the passion of Jesus' life. Therefore, if we're to follow after Jesus, it should be the passion of our life. And we must ask ourselves this, what does meekness have to do with the glory of God? How does becoming meek and becoming meek promote the hallowing or the holiness of God's name? In this, we'll discover that meekness is a very beautiful thing, even though sometimes it can be painful. Uh, this verse also alludes to Psalms 37, probably the beginning. It's almost a parallel of that. Psalm 37, 11 says, The meek shall possess the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. The words Psalms, in Psalms 37, 11 are almost identical with Matthew 5, 5. The meek shall inherit the land, and the work for land means earth. So let's try and see what meekness and this psalms has to do with God. The meek who wait for the Lord. A parallel in verses 11 and verse 9. The meek shall possess the land. Verse 9 says, those who wait for the Lord shall possess the land. So people who wait for the Lord, what does it mean to wait for the Lord? We get a picture of that in verses 5 through 8. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your vindication as the light. And you're right as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over him who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. So what are these people like according to verses 11 and verse 9? What is it like waiting for the Lord? Verse 5 says they commit their way to the Lord and trust in the Lord. Verse 7 says they're quiet or still before the Lord and do not fret over those who prosper. And verse 8 says they refrain from anger and forsake wrath. So putting this together, number one, they trust in God. Meek people begin by trusting God. They believe that he will work for them. He will vindicate them when others oppose them. Biblical meekness is rooted and deep in confidence that God is for you and not against you. And two, they commit their way to God. The Hebrew word for commit means literally to roll. Meek means, meek people have discovered that God is trustworthy. So they roll their way, their business, they roll their problems, their relationships, their health, their fears, their frustrations, all on to the Lord. They admit that they are insufficient to cope with the complexities and pressures and the obstacles of life and trust that God is able and willing to sustain them and guide them and protect them. They are quiet before God and wait for Him. Meek people are quiet or still, and they wait patiently. First, they discover that God can be trusted. 
And then they just, a second, they commit their way to him. And then third, they wait patiently in stillness for the work of God to happen in their lives. It doesn't mean they become lazy. It, mean, it means they become free or not worried and stressed and frenzy. They have a steady calmness that comes from knowing that God is omnipotent, all-powerful, that he has their affairs under his control, and that he is gracious and will work things out for the best. Meek people have a quiet steadiness about their lives in the midst of a people. They don't try to fix it themselves. They let God take care of it because maybe God's idea is different than what we think our idea is. They don't fret over the wicked, number four. So the things, the fourth thing is they don't fret who people who prosper, the wicked who prosper in their way. As verse eight says, they refrain from anger. Their family and work and life are in God's sovereign hands. They trust him. They wait patiently on him. They quietly to see how his power and goodness will work things out. And so the setbacks and the obstacles and the opponents of life do not produce the bitterness and anger and fretfulness that is so common for us to have. Their family and their work life are in God's hands. They trust him. They wait patiently and quietly to see how his power and goodness will work things out. So the portrait we have of meekness so far based on a biblical parallel, parallel in Psalms 37, 11, and to third beatitude begins by trusting God. Then it commits its way to the Lord and in the confidence that he will use his power and mercy to do good for us. Then it waits patiently and quietly for the outcome. And finally, it does not give way to anger and fretfulness when faced with opposition and setbacks. So it is clear that meekness has very much to do with God. It consists in a peaceful freedom from fretful anger and is based on trusting God and rolling our ways onto God and waiting patiently for God. Meekness has very much to do with God. I know that's a lot of words, but I'm going to say it again. It's clear that meekness has much to do with God. It consists through a peaceful freedom from anger based on trusting God and putting all our ways onto God and waiting patiently for God. Moses had a picture of some meekness. Numbers 12, 1 through 4 describes when Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses severely. They spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman which he had married. They said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek, and more than all were faced on, on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses, and to Aaron, and to Miriam, Come out, you three of the tent of meeting. What happens in the following verses is the Lord rebukes Miriam and Aaron and vindicates his servant Moses. Now what is the point of calling Moses meek right here? Right between bitter opposition and God's vindication. I think the point is meekness means committing your cause to God and not needing to defend yourself. Just where we would expect the text to tell us. Moses said to justify himself against the charge. And the text was the meekest man on the earth. Moses doesn't say a word. Instead, he waits patiently for the Lord. He frets not over the words and God comes to his defense. So we can add, our, add to that meekness, not only does the trust in God and commits our ways to God and waits patiently for God and refrains from anger, it also refrains from revenge and defensiveness. It love, meekness loves to give place to wrath and leaves its vindication with God. Meekness is the power to absorb adversity and criticism without lashing back. Another portrait, portrait of this is in James 1, 19-21. Know this, my beloved brethren, let every man be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rank growth of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which will all, all able to save your souls. James has in mind two kinds of people. He pictures the one hand, the person who does not like to listen to what other people have to say, especially if they speak with authority. The person is quick to speak and quick to become angry if the words cross his opinion or call his behavior into question. He is not receptive to the word of God. He filters it through his own desires and receives it selectively if he receives it at all. Receives it at all. On the other hand, James pictures another kind of person, 
the person that is slow to speak and quick to listen. This person recognizes the limitations of his knowledge and his fallibility of his thinking, and is eager to listen and learn anything valuable that he can. If he hears something new or contrary to his own view, his first reaction is not fretful anger. He is slow to anger. He listens and considers. And when it comes to the Word of God, he receives it with meekness. So another feature is meekness is its teachability. To be able to receive the Word with meekness means we don't have to have a resistant, hostile spirit when we're being taught. It doesn't mean we're gullible. It doesn't even mean we'll, we will never get angry about what some people teach. Verse 19 says we should be slow to anger. Not that we should never experience anger. Jesus did. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, he says, I am meek and lowly in heart. But in Mark 35, he says, become angry and grieved at the hard-heartedness of the Pharisees. And in Matthew 21, he drove out the merchants out of the temple and turned over their tables. Meekness not, does not mean the absence of passion and conviction and even indignation for the glory of God. But it does mean we don't have hair triggers. It does mean that our disposition is one of readiness to listen and to learn. It does mean that we are slow to write off a person, slow to condemn, slow to anger. Let us be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves in discerning what is meek and what is pride. In James 3, 13 and 17, 13 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good life, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. The truly wise people are also the truly meek people. In verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure and then peaceable, gentle, open to reason. Notice that the reason is the truly wise person is also the truly meek person. Is that true wisdom is peace, gentleness, and open to reason. But these are the marks of meekness. Kind of remarkable that the marks of biblical wisdom and biblical wis meekness are pretty much the same. Wisdom in the Bible is never a merely intellectual. It's the position of your heart as well as your head. Therefore, in a sense, meekness and wisdom are kind of one thing. They're both peace, gentleness, and reasonable. So back in James 1, 19 through 21, it ties back there that we saw that meekness meant being quick to listen and slow to criticize and condemn. Here, meekness is open to reason. Where a man speaks, the other listens. And they deal reasonably with what was said instead of just blurting something out, irrelevant, or making a quick judgment. Does not scripture teach us that there is correlation between meekness and reasonableness? And is not reasonableness basically the willing to listen to another person's reason for his opinion and willing to give reasons for yours? Put forward an opinion without giving reason for it except that it's my opinion. I would not be acting in meekness no matter how soft-spoken I might be. On the contrary, I would be acting in an authoritarian way because I would be appealing to nothing outside of myself. I think it's a good deal of confusion about the meaning of meekness sometimes, and the very important for us the way we do our business together. We must be aware of confusing temperaments with meekness and the absence of meekness. A conversation between two people may be passionate and heated, and still be marked by meekness if both of these people are speaking reasonably. That is, if they're defending their opinions by appealing not to themselves, but to a standard of truth that is over them and which they are a humble servant. But on the other hand, there could be a very soft-spoken, laid-back conversation between two people in which they express their different opinions, but instead of arguing for them with reason and submitting themselves together to a higher standard or truth, they give an impression of being self-effacing by saying they just don't want their opinion. They just want to give their opinion and not argue about it. No one has to accept my opinion, and I don't have to accept anyone else's. Let live and let live. That's not a sign of meekness. Too often we think this is the spirit of meekness. Two people making a claim on another person's opinion, refusing to submit their own opinion to an independent standard of truth, unwilling to make themselves vulnerable to the claims of truth, and the possibility of need to admit their error. That is not the spirit of meekness. No matter how soft-spoken or self-effacing it looks on the outside, it's not. It's self-protecting. What could be more serviceable, serviceable to the spirit of pride than the view of that neither you or I have to give our account of our opinions before any standard, but for our own private selves? 
Wisdom in the Bible is never merely an intellectual affair. We are no longer on the road. We have arrived. Most pivotal thinkers of our day would call the multiplication table a way of using a language to help us get what we want. That's all. The secular world in which we live is populated by people who do not make their choices on the base of an ultimate standard or truth. All truth today has become relative. And even people are doing that truth with the Bible. Meekness cares about the truth. Meekness is open, is a, a wisdom is open to reason, is quick to listen to the reasons given by others for their opinions, and is willing to give reasons for their own for its own opinions. It cares about truth and whether others agree, and therefore it may become passionate and forceful, but it is always a servant. It is always submissive to a higher standard of truth. It is always willing to change to bring its opinions in line with truth. Meekness knows its own fallibility, but for the reason it takes debate and argument so seriously, it wants to discern its own errors and forsake them. But the soft-spoken conversation in which two modern people defer each other's opposite opinions, not failing the need to submit, submit his opinion to a standard of higher truth than himself, and thus not exposing himself to the possibility of error and repentance, that is not a spirit of meekness. So let's look at the whole portrait. Meekness begins when we put our trust in God. Then, because we trust God, we commit our ways to God. We put all our anxieties, our frustrations, our plans, our relationships, our jobs, our health onto God. And then we wait, the dreaded P word, patiently, for the Lord. We trust in His timing and His power and His grace to work things out that it's the best way for His glory and for our good. We've got to come to that realization. His glory is for our good. The result of trusting God and putting our anxieties onto Him and waiting patiently for God is that we don't give away to quick and fretful anger. But more like Moses, we give place to wrath in our hand and we hand our cause over to God and let Him vindicate us if He chooses. And then as James says in this quiet confidence, we are slow to speak and quick to listen. We become reasonable reasonable and open to correction. Meekness loves to learn and accounts the blows of a friend as precious. And when it must say a critical word to a person caught in sin or error, it speaks from the deep conviction of its own fallibility and its own susceptibility to sin and its utter dependence on the grace of God. Meekness begins with God and meekness ends with God. And therefore, whenever we see a person like that, we have God the glory and the aim of Jesus that the Sermon on the Mount is fulfilled. They shall inherit the earth, the second half. The effect Jesus wants this promise to have on the disciples is that he wants the promise to give them strength and to continue in their meekness. This is the way the promise works in verse 12. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. In other words, the promise of great reward gives the disciples strength to endure persecution with joy. So I think the promise that the meek shall inherit the earth is intended by the Lord to give us strength to endure in meekness when the natural person would want to defend ourselves or retaliate or give away to anger. In 1 Corinthians 3, there's a passage that helps see the promise of inheriting the earth and gives strength to the meekness. In verses 18 through 23, Paul tries to help us overcome pride. The Corinthians were boasting in a different teachers and in their worldly wisdom. Paul says, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool for that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So let no one boast of men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. You are Christ, and Christ is God's. Verse 21, let of no one boast of men, for all things are yours. And the one thing it mentioned in the world, don't boast because the world is yours. Does that make sense? You don't need the vain pleasures of one-up man, manship because God 
has already made you an heir of the world. Would we have to have that? My house is bigger than your house. My car is nicer than your car. I have more money in the bank and than you do if we knew and believed that our father owned the city and I was the beneficiary in his will. The quietness and openness of vulnerability of meekness is very beautiful and a very painful thing. It goes against all that we are by our sinful nature. It requires supernatural help, and that help is available. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ sitting at his feet on the mount this, morning, this, this day, that if you trust him and commit your way to him and wait patiently for him, God has already, already begun to help you, and he will help you more. Help you more. And the primary way that he helps you is to assure your heart that you are a fellow heir of Jesus Christ and that the world and everything in it is yours. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. We will not freely give us all things with him. All things, no good thing will be withheld from those who walk uprightly. Blessed are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Happy are the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. Our inheritance is the kingdom. Our kingdom is God's. And I pray you get something out of that tonight. Thank you.